Hey, have I got an idea for a story? Yeah. I, you just got to pick a subject. Okay, first, first memory. First memory was 1980, here for the world titles. Was pretty sort of disillusioned with it here because it was all pine trees and flat and didn't have a really good feeling for it. So Saturday was when the juniors started. So we had the day off and some friends came and grabbed me. And then they just, uh, we walked over and just checked the sort of, and all of a sudden I look up, it's six to eight foot, it is A-frames. And I look at them and I go, are you kidding? And I, and I was sort of speechless. And they said, oh, we don't surf here, it's too fast. Okay, so I've since found out that had been surfed before in summer. I think Hackman surfed it in the early 70s on a longboard when it was small. But uh, six to eight foot, just draining barrels, just spitting just lefts and rights. But of course, I only saw the right, so. I basically looked at them and uh, I often tell the story, it was like the chariots of fire. Da -da 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 -da. I was back to the house, it was like slow motion, running into the room, grabbing my board. Rabbit was in the same, Rabbit Bartholomew was in the same room with me. Uh, I looked up, they just got back from the nightclub and uh, how's the surf? I said, best fucking surf I've seen in my life and just went. So of course I went out there and for the first 20 minutes I tried to get the big ones just being in my DNA and I just got my ass kicked so bad. So anyhow, so all of a sudden I calmed it down and took some four footers, got a couple of barrels, six foot, working my way into it. All of a sudden I see Rabbit walking over the hill. He had his board under his arm and I made sure I got about a six footer. I got a double barrel. I sort of can remember stuff like this. Got this double barrel and got spat out like a shotgun. As I was flicking out, he was rabbit running down the beach, chariots of fire, da da. And uh, I surfed seven and a half hours that day, non-stop. So I had the day out. I think at one stage there, some people had said I didn't fall for three and a half hours. I was just getting just into it. It was, and I didn't even realize there were people on the beach. All the people had walked up from the central and, and, and they just walked up. There was like 500 people on the beach. I sort of came in and was like freaking out because all these people, I guess they'd never seen tube riding before. So that was one of my, that, 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 that particular day changed my life forever. And I think it changed a lot of other people's because it turned up in Surfing Magazine and everyone, we just went shit, France has got some of the best waves in the world. Thrusters came along and I looking for that magic board and I finally got this magic board. I've still got it. This six eight by 19 and a quarter by three inches thick square. It's the famous bottom turn I did in one of the posters. It became my barrel board. When people ask me about one board that I've had in my life, there's one board that stands head and shoulders above all the rest to the point where in 1991 or something, I'd called Tom Curran and I said, come down to La Piste. La Piste is like six to eight foot, and I'm talking back door, big back door size, you know, six to eight foot of wine. I said, come down, I got no one to surf with and didn't. So I was out there by myself and I had that board and I was having a great time picking off waves, just free falling in, in the barrel, getting spat out, no turns because you'd try and get over the back as quick as possible so you wouldn't get the next way. So Tom came down. Yep. And Tom came down and anyhow, he looked like he was having a bit of a hard time. So anyhow, so I came out of the water and all the locals, there was a couple of old fishermen, uh, you know, and a couple of the young guys there, and they just said, you just, you're a better tube rider than Tom Curran. And I went, what do you mean? What do you mean? He said, he hasn't made a wave yet, you know? So I went back to the car and I didn't really think much of it. I said, that's bizarre. Next minute, Tom came over to the car and he's like, uh, um, <coughs> uh, look, uh, did, did, uh, did, you know, what, do you, and I said, what board are you riding? He said, oh, I got a 6-1. He's, you know, but then he went back to, uh, um, do you think you could maybe make me a gun? And I went, yeah, Tom. And he said, oh, I could get it glassed and 
sanded. And I said, Tom, I've got a surfboard factory. I can get it glassed and sanded too. And he went, oh, that'd be great. And he went, how long is your board? And I went, 6'8". And he went, make me a 6'9". And that was the start of Tom and I making a magic quiver of boards that he went on and won the world titles from the, from the, uh, from the trials to world champion. And then the following year we did the reverse V and we made all the guns and we got all the guns done and he won the contest in Hawaii. So once again, one surfboard, one session can change lives, change my life. <laughs> The Logalers, they were all the Logalers boards, okay? I sent the boards two weeks before Tom left. The boards got lost. I got to Hawaii and I got there the day, a couple of days before the Con Air started. And Tom went, where are the boards? He's got no boards. We got the call on the Friday afternoon. The boards, we've just found them. They've just hit customs, go and get them. Now, I've been known to drive at two speeds, which is in those days was just stop and flat out. I think we broke the record to the airport, grabbed all the, I can remember the guys waving at me as we left. We just dumped all the boards. I mean, we grabbed the boards and dropped all the shit at the airport, all the bubble pack and the boxes and just left the mess. We went flying back to, Pia, uh, to Puina Point, which is just opposite Halle Eva. And we had half an hour to test the boards. So he rocked up the next morning and he surfed the 7 8. Yep, for, for, uh, he, <laughs> he surfed the 7 8 on the Saturday. It was huge, Halle Eva. The Sunday I went down and the swell was going to drop. And he had this magic 7 2. And I looked at him and went, the 7 2, mate. And he looked at me and went, and I went, what? And he went, oh, I left it back at the Kui Lima. I had to literally drive on a Sunday from the quarterfinals and I drove like a maniac, like th that would have been the most manic drive. I drove from Halle Eva to the Kui Lima and back in about an hour and 20 minutes. I was on the wrong side of the road on a Sunday with the horn on, hoping trucks weren't coming. Got the board, came flying back, the finals already paddled out and Tom was just walking up and down, just walking up and down, just on the grass there in his Connors jersey. Saw me pull up and uh, all my Hawaiian friends are all the security there. They'd cleared a path. I came virtually through the parking lot, over the, just uh, over these bumps, like just into the air and landed just near this, jumped out, pulled the board out. And Tom walks up and goes, you haven't got any wax, have you? And that was the no stress Tom, you know? And so he went out and won that contest. He won the finals. Well, the reverse V was a little bit of a mistake in that there was a whole group, uh, sorry, a container of boards uh, arrived and some of them were tweaked and they had too much curve. And I had this thing where I wanted to do a board without any V at all but not being a very good shaper I actually accidentally put the V in the front of the board and took the V out between the fins and it had an inch more nose rocker and three quarters of an inch more tail rocker which it was really curvy it looked beautiful but no one had ever surfed that so anyhow so I um, I made one for Tom and gave it to him and he actually called me back that night and he went this board's insane it's faster it carves and I go yeah yeah right Tom because he's got a real dry sense of humor I said yeah bring all your other boards back from last year he was there seven o'clock in the morning with all these boards from last year the ones he's magic quiver and I went for real and he went for real this thing's so much faster and it's vertical and carves so it took us a long time to work out it was like what we, Nick Carroll and I call a happy mistake, you know, so it was a little bit of a mistake and I turned that mistake, that one board, I've still got it. I still have that board at home, yeah, so I've kept a couple, so yeah, so the whole reverse V thing then took off and those funny looking blanks with the curve, I made 61 of those that year for the tour and 58 of them were magic boards and people took, home, took them home. So it was actually 
a quantum a quantum leap in surfboard performance so that that's sort of what i'm still trying to do first time i ever saw rocky yeah was at bells and i looked up and i'd just come out of the water and i saw this cocky looking kid flicking his hair walking down the and i went in you know like a like a really bright fluoro suit i went god are you kidding aren't you are you kidding me you know I said, what's surfing come to? And I was standing up there getting changed and I can remember there was the judging stands and there was a, a caravan and all of this and in between there was a gap. All of a sudden, all I see is, is this guy go off the bottom and straight up and just crack the lip and I just went, what? And he came straight down and did exactly the same and it reminded me of when I first saw Wayne Lynch at the world titles in 1970. It was like, you know, everyone was trimming across. I think they deducted points off Wayne because he kept going up and down and up and down. Like, you wouldn't have scored the other guys in today's, in today's scoring. The other guys would barely get a 1.5 or a 2. Wayne would have been up around the 6 or 7. So it was like this Wayne Lynch, Ockie sort of thing. And uh, then over the years, Ock would come and stay with us and it was like having our having a kid without kids you know but you know he was one hell of a magic human being and i've got too many stories to actually pick one but the first one was just like are you kidding me and then i saw you know the absolute genius of his surfing you know and uh, you just watch that over the years but yeah you know it was really sad because in one sense Oki he um he'd been in portugal and his dad died and sanger died it's his best mate mark sainsbury so when he came up we didn't realize what the effect it had on him and i remember him coming up and he sort of knocked on the door which was really bizarre and he, mate can i stay here mate please and i went mate you're always welcome here come and stay here so he basically sort of had a bit of a breakdown and just sort of went out in left field, went out in left field and started drinking and just, and you know, he buried his boards on the beach and, and uh, because he wanted to keep them there because he wanted to go back to Australia and I think he wanted to swim and go back to Australia. Um, and he had this piece of wood that was sort of like his Tai Chi stick. And he thought he was gonna swim home from here via China and go to, Tiananmen Square and I mean he, he uh, in one sense a lot of people thought it was really funny but in a sense it was really really sad because we none of us knew what to do we didn't know what to do was he having a nervous breakdown was this just some sort of you know now we know people have depression bipolar schizophrenia you know I mean we've lost a lot of friends so you know on a more serious note it woke all of us up and going shit, you know, because we've always looked after our mates. No matter what, in those days, we surfed harder than fucking anybody does these days because there wasn't leashes and there wasn't cameras and that, yet we'd surf from morning till dark, but we'd also party harder than, if these guys knew how, we, how hard we partied in those days, but we always looked after our own. Everyone was always looked at us. There was a couple of us, you know, like Barton and Ross and myself, who would do a check at the end of the night, you know, where's so-and-so, where's so-and-so, shit, the list was long. And we'd made sure we, we, no one was left behind. I think that's the Marines, isn't it? <laughs> Don't leave a man behind. Well, we were definitely on that, mi that mission. It was like an, like an inner sanctum, you know, so journalists weren't allowed in, journalists weren't allowed out close. If journalists got too close, uh, I guess they were threatened, you know? They were threatened with uh, disciplinary <laughs> uh, actions. So yeah, so anyhow, so that sort of, that sort of was a different era. Yeah, it was a different era to now. Uh, it was a lot more fun. <laughs> That's epic, man. Cheers.